BTA. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. Good time last night? Amazing. Amazing. So welcome. Welcome to what's set to be a fantastic day uh, of strategic planning and getting some real critical, strong feedback from your peers on, uh, on, on your strategic plans as we head into a new decade. So fantastic. We're going to kick it off with Brian Scudamore, founder and CEO of 1-800-GOT-JUNK and O2E Brands. He's a man that needs little introduction uh, in this industry. Um, his, uh, his junk hauling company has come from humble beginnings in Vancouver, late 80s, um, and, uh, and is now producing over a million dollars a day in revenue with markets across, uh, across North America and Australia. So at O2E Brands, their portfolio has now grown to include Shack Shine, uh, as well as Wow One Day Painting. So, we're going to get into some really good discussions today with Brian. It's a pleasure to have him here. So thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me, Igor. Um, so let's kick it off with this. Not many of us in this room have followed a traditional career path. I think we realized from a pretty young age that we're, we're different than the rest of the boys and girls that we went to school with when we were young. Um, tell us about how the son of a transplant surgeon ended up with a $700 Ford pickup truck and hauling escargot shells off the side of a mountain and created yeah. all this. So, so Yeah, well, so back in 89, which sounds so long ago, makes me feel really old right now. But if I think back to high school, I was in grade 12, was one course short of graduation, and just didn't complete. I remember walking across the stage, and I got, instead of a diploma at graduation, was a, hey, nice try, try again kind of thing. And there I was going, all my buddies were going to college, every single one of them and had to find a way to talk myself into college, because thank you, I had a bit of FOMO, and I had to find a way to pay for it. And I tried to get some money from my parents for a student loan from the parents, and they wouldn't do it. They said, you didn't finish high school. Why would we fund your college education? The ROI is not there, and they were right. And I said, I'm gonna find a way to do this. I was in a McDonald's drive through saw a pickup truck in front of me that said Mark's Hauling, had plywood sides up on the box, and I was like, I'm gonna go buy a truck and haul junk. And it was just meant to be a simple summer job that was to fund my college education. But ironically, in those first three years of going to school, I learned and I talked my way into college without a high school diploma. But I was spending three years in school learning way more running a business than I was studying in school. And so I made the bold decision to sit down with my dad. And as an optimistic, you, you said this to me earlier, you go, you're always so optimistic. And I'm a half, a glass half full type guy all the time. And I sat down with my dad, liver transplant surgeon, who's done more schooling than anyone I've ever met. And I go, Dad, I got some good news for you. He goes, really? I go, yes, yeah, sit down. I said, I'm dropping out of college. And he's like, what? How is that good news? And I said, because I get to build my business and really grow it. And long story short, he said, you know, school is important. Finish your degree. You got one year left. And I said, UBC, the school I was going to, will be there for years to come. My business opportunity might not. And I'm going to strike while the iron's hot, and the rest is history. Awesome. So you're saying the only school you ever graduated from was elementary school? Uh, kindergarten. Kindergarten. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's, I know it's funny, but I literally, I, I remember I've got a picture of me graduating with my little kindergarten diploma. That was but, but I didn't graduate from high school. I didn't graduate from college. I went to 14 schools. I wasn't a great kid, so some of that was getting kicked out of school. But, and you know, and I don't want to say I don't like to learn, but I know you, you understand this. You were talking about, you know, some entrepreneurs have ADD and trouble focusing. I love learning. I just can't sit in a classroom. Right. And so it didn't work for me. Did the system fail me? Maybe, but. I found other ways to learn, and that's asking questions, talking to people, and learning from people just like you. Awesome. Awesome. So in your book, you wrote this phrase, audacity begins when you start talking about things that haven't yet happened as though they already have. But you must believe in your deepest core that they will come to pass no matter what. Mm -hmm. One thing that I've always 
highly respected was, was how you cast a vision and set a vision and how you spend so much time thinking about where you're going to go and where the people that, that follow you are going to go. So tell us a little bit about like your tactics when it comes to building long-term vision and strategy, which we're, of course, thinking about today as we head into this new year and, and this new decade. How do you go about doing that? How do you go about thinking before you act? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a great question. So I discovered the power of vision by accident. Now, any successful person uses visioning in their life uh, as, as a tool, whether they realize it or not. You can be an athlete, you can be a prime minister, you can be someone in, in, in um, business, religion, whatever leadership position you're in, you succeed by having a very crystal clear vision or what I call a painted picture of where you're going. Now, I discovered this by accident. I hit a million dollars in revenue with my business which I felt excited about, but I also felt like, man, that took eight years to get there. You know, now we do a million dollars a day or more, but it took eight years to get there. And I joined, once I hit a million, I joined the entrepreneur organization. It used to be called YEO, the Young Entrepreneur Organization. Then we all started getting older, so they rebranded. So I joined EO, and that became my way of learning. Instead of school, I'd learn from other mentors who had great businesses. But something happened. I started comparing myself to others in the EO organization. And I'm like, man, this guy has a bigger tech company. This woman's got this most awesome business. She's franchised. And I'm looking at these businesses and I'm feeling like my itty bitty junk removal company isn't very glamorous. And so I started to go down a bit of a doom loop. And EO teaches you when you want to be creative, go to a creative place to solve a problem. So I went to Bowen Island, which I know some of your team knows. My parents used to have this little shack on the water. And I went over there and I sat down on, it was almost like this is the dock. I sat down on the edge of the dock and I'm like, man, million dollars in revenue, eight years, don't have the, the education. I don't really have the money. I don't even know if this is something that could be built, but what if? What if I could only imagine pure possibility of vision? What could it look, feel, and act like? So I took out a sheet of paper, literally this September 17th, 98, or whatever it was, 97, sitting on that dock, and I started to write what it could look like. And I said, there's going to be no boundaries. Just whatever I can imagine and dream, audacity, I'm going to write it down. And it went something like this. We will be in the top 30 metros in North America by the end of 2003, which was five years out. We would be the FedEx of junk removal, clean, shiny trucks, friendly uniform drivers. We'd be on the Oprah Winfrey show. I mean, just absolute nonsense. But somehow I wrote this out, just what came straight from my heart, straight from my head. And then I read, and I'm getting chills right now. It happens every time I tell this story because I read my one page double-sided painted picture and I'm like, I can actually see that. I can truly see every single one of these things happening. And I think that big, hairy, audacious goals start by just opening your mind up to possibility. I immediately went from a doom loop, oh my gosh, I'm not sure I like my life and where I'm at, to I'm on a mission here. And so I went out and I started talking to my team. And what was interesting is I shared this painted picture. I said, this is where we're going. Do you want in? And about half the team over three months said, Brian, this is amazing. I want to be a part. The other half of the team said, like, I don't know what kind of hope dope you're smoking, but good luck. <laughs> and they left. But five years later, and you know, cutting a long story short, we did it. We got an Oprah. We were the FedEx of junk removal. We built uh, a brand that today is, you know, this, this year we'll do 455 million in revenue just with 1-800-GOT-JUNK. And not saying that to brag, but just saying, like, you think of a big, bold idea. People tell you this can never be done. I got those people out of my life. I'm like, I, I don't need to hang around with someone that doesn't believe in my vision. It's my vision. I see it. If you don't see it, that's okay. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Um, in, in, in the book and in, in, in many of our conversations, you talk a lot about just this concept <clears throat> of believing in possibility of what could be. Mm -hmm. um, when we, when you think about like the tactical first steps that you take, I think um, you know it's it, it's one to write the plan and to write the vision. When you took uh, that huge leap of going from one location in Vancouver, you running a bunch of trucks, a bunch of haulers and drivers, what were like what were some of the steps that you took, the first steps that you took to real true expansion to complement mm -hmm. that that vision? Yeah, so <clears throat> it's interesting. If I think back to that time when I expanded to the first location, I'd read the E Myth by Michael Gerber. Anyone here read the E Myth? 
Yeah, okay, I figured. Uh, awesome book, right? All about people don't fail, systems do. How do you systematize your business? Build it out like a franchise, even if you're not franchising. So I said, I gotta build the first business prototype. And I went to Victoria. I had someone run the Vancouver operation, and I said, I'm gonna take everything I learned in Vancouver and replicate it. And it started to work. And then I expanded into the third market. I haven't shared this story all that often, but there was a guy, um, Mike McKee, who was one of my employees, who went on to become a competitor. And uh, he went on, we were great friends, and he calls me one day and he said, are you sitting down? I said, no, he said, you should. I said, I'm not going to. He said, uh, I'm going into business against you. And I said, when? And he goes, today. And I'm like, what? So big surprise, he goes out and starts this company, Trash Busters, and took everything I had learned. I did something bad, it was a failure. I started to be motivated by fear that this guy was gonna do a better job than me and grow and take business away, and I got scared. A couple of years into competition, they expanded into Seattle. So I had Vancouver and Victoria, and I'm like, man, they're in the US, I gotta be in the US. So to answer your question, I took that step of expansion, but I took it out of fear. Now, in hindsight, it worked out. But I said, man, I gotta get trucks down there, I gotta get my trademarks in the US, I gotta beat this guy. And so I think it's paying attention sometimes to what your real motivation is. Mm. Um, the, the, the mistake in the story that I made was I got obsessed about Trash Buster's growth, because at one point they were beating us in revenue. And, uh, and it hurt my ego, right? You know, you're like, oh, I wanna be number one. And, and it was tough. They're no longer around today, which is, it was fine and I've chatted with some of the guys that started the business and so we're all friends and it's good, but it, it taught me that don't compare yourself to others. I did it with comparing myself to EO when I shouldn't have. I did it in comparing myself to uh, Trash Busters. Mm -hmm. Just get out there and do the best job I possibly could and what, I, what was great about that expansion into Seattle was I said the number one thing that's gotta drive us is being better than everyone else. And so we defined how do we do that. We came up with what we call our QFAs, our quality focus areas, uh, on-time service, upfront rates, clean, shiny trucks, and friendly, uniform drivers. We became obsessed with those things that kept us driving the vision and the business forward. Mm -hmm. So we were talking earlier about uh, a topic that, of course, really correlates to this, which especially in our world here living in 2020, um, social media is everywhere, the influ influencers are everywhere. How do you just how do you not get caught up in the hype of growth and more specifically how do you know when it's right to grow versus when it's too early and you might be doing it out of ego you know what are some of those things that you feel in, in any business or generalities that should be in place before you can grow in a healthy efficient way yeah i mean i i, I think if i look at my 30 years in business what's always driven me is making meaning not money um, I loved money from a yardstick of growth. It's right. a game, you're winning, it's like, yeah, this is awesome. And so it's a million, it's two million, it's five. It wasn't really about, I mean, we had to be profitable and we had to focus on that because the company couldn't continue to thrive, but it was about how do we change people's lives? How do we inspire entrepreneurship? How do we take someone who's working in the trucks and have them grow into the head office and the junction and, and then you know, eventually start their own business? That's what drove us. And I think because we were always very clear, not always, most of the time clear on what our why was and what was driving us, it made decision making easier. I think when you look at uh, growth and expansion, you gotta be able to sort of separate the ego and say, am I growing here just because growth is so exciting and enticing? Or am I growing because this is going to accomplish my vision, my purpose, why I've started this business? Um, you know, you and I were chatting before coming up here that there's so many entrepreneurs today, and, and I think it's, it's, it's a commonplace kind of millennial, I'm gonna go start a business, I'm gonna build it up in five years, it's, it's gonna be this app that's gonna take over the world and I'm gonna sell it for a billion. I mean, Instagram got lucky, you know? Uh, Kevin started a business that completely changed from where he started, like, it, it just doesn't happen. And so how do you be grounded in reality? Like some might say, you know, on the flip side, they might go, Brian, you said you were gonna be on Oprah and you said you guys were gonna be, you know, a billion dollar company one day and we will. You've gotta have a big, hairy, audacious goal, but it's gotta be not winning the lottery. It's gotta be something that you truly see that you can do. Right, right. 
So let's, let's talk about some of the things that you didn't love along the journey and naturally mm -hmm. didn't love maybe from when you were young. Um, maybe whether it's reviewing financials or creating intricate business plans or the precision required in strong hiring. Um, you know, adding complementary skill sets, and I think we all know this, adding complementary skill sets that complement a founder's role mm -hmm. is, is very important in business. I think with, with how complex the business environment is, it's, it, in my opinion, it's, it's unrealistic to think that, that me or you as one individual have everything that it takes. Um, something that I've always really admired is how you've understood your strengths and weaknesses and strategically, uh, whether you did it right the first time or not, but you've, you've, you've battled hard to bring in the yin to your yang, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit about that. Like, how did, you, um, how did you go about doing that successfully, right from understanding yourself to taking all these very complex and long, uh, and taking this arduous journey to, to, be with, uh, where, to be where you're at now with your team? Mm -hmm. When, so when I built up to a million, uh, up to that point, I was doing everything. You know, I did the accounting and payroll, I did the sales, it, it did it all, right? Sometimes I'd answer the phones in the call center. And it's tough for an entrepreneur, for a leader, I think, to let go of what they're not best at. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I definitely learned the hard way by, by feeling like my ego was amazing at everything and then realizing, wow, someone comes into the sales center, they're booking way more, converting way more jobs than I was because they're better at it. And I started to look at sort of e-mything my business in a sense and going, what can I take myself away from? You know, start parsing off every part of the business to find someone that does it better. So you talk about financials. I, I hate looking at financials. I actually love numbers, but I just don't like spending the time going through spreadsheets and so on. I had to find people that did it better. So I brought Cameron Harold in at about two million in revenue. And he was a good buddy of mine from EO. He was in my forum group, comes into the business and we grew it from two million to 106 million together. And I was the best man in his wedding. We became really good friends. And I realized he and I were too similar. We used to say that we were both fire ready aim types. And that works in an entrepreneurial journey, but as the business got to probably 75 million in revenue, I started to see that, man, we're moving too fast. We're somewhat reckless. We're making some decisions that are hurting people and hurting the business and had to look at doing things differently. And what ultimately happened was I realized because you talk about yin and yang, Cameron and I were two yin and yin. I mean, both ADD, high energy, let's just conquer the world. And while he was an amazing executor, and today is still an amazing friend, I had to make the tough decision to fire my best buddy. And I talk about this in the book, that the, the right decision is seldom the easy one. It was one of the hardest freaking decisions I've ever made in my life. Now, if Cameron was up on stage here, he'd say to all of you, He'd say it was the right decision for both of us. It hurt at the time, but I had to have the right person to take things to the next level. So what I did, I love taking out a sheet of paper and solving problems, and I started to write down as I was recruiting uh, my third COO. Uh, so I had Cameron Harold. I had a Starbucks situation where I had an executive from there that didn't work out. But then to get, my, to get it right this time, Eric Church, who's our COO today, eight years, hopefully forever, um, I pulled out a sheet of paper and I drew a line down the middle. On one side, I wrote all the things that a business needs that I'm great at, that I'm passionate about and love to do. On the other side, I wrote all the things in the business that I can't stand, that I'm bad at. I mean, it was a way longer list. But I said, the business needs this. So I got out and started looking for, I wrote sort of a mini painted picture of what I was looking for describing that person. I had three people across North America when I sent out this little vision of who I was looking for that said, you're looking for Eric Church. Unrelated, different parts of the country. They said, your, your person is Eric Church. And sure enough, it was, because I was so clear on the weaknesses I was looking to fill, and I so well described them, that ultimately what happened is I found the exact person I had envisioned. But I found someone that I remember when I presented this mini vision to Eric, Eric goes, that's me. He goes, I'm not just trying to tell you that. He goes, like, seriously, there's not a word in here that isn't accurate. I don't know how you envisioned me, but this is me. All the stuff that you hate to do, I freaking love to do. 
And he goes, the stuff you love to do, I, I don't know how to do, I'm not good at. I mean, it became that perfect match. And so I think as an entrepreneur, and when you've got, I've heard the average sort of revenue is about two million in this room. If you get to a $2 million level, I believe you need to have your second in command, your yin to your yang, someone that can help you scale. Because otherwise, if you're still doing absolutely everything, you're gonna get stuck, you're gonna limit your growth. You can't scale and grow your people, your business without having someone take the stuff that you suck at. And, and we all do, like, I mean, Eric sucks at a lot of stuff, but thankfully he's got me and vice versa. And we've got a team. And once you know and you're able to confront those potential gaps, that's huge power. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, the, the leader that complements you is important, and, and the rest of the team, a strong rest of the team is also really important. Something we, that's, that's a big part of the BTA management system is, of course, this concept of really focused strategic recruiting and hiring and vetting. And I think a lot of companies get caught up in, in the focus of traditional marketing, like mm -hmm. to the consumer, um, but there isn't nearly enough focus on the energy and the time and resources and money that gets invested into bringing really great people into the organization. So mm -hmm. when I walk into the junction, it says the, the whole, and if you haven't been there to the junction, you should. It's yeah. amazing. The whole office is wrapped, and it says it's all about the people when you walk in. Mm -hmm. um, that phrase. So, what does it mean to you? And and what are the biggest keys that you mm -hmm. found and that you kind of speak to to your team mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to attracting, developing, retaining people, especially mm -hmm. today's millennials? Yeah. So first of all, thanks for inviting everyone to the junction. No, I'm just kidding. You're, you are all welcome at any time. Um, if you want to go on to my Instagram and send me a note one day, whatever, or Facebook, uh, come on in. We do, we do actually do tours just to sort of share what we've learned from, from others. Uh, so happy to host you if you're ever in town uh, and free. So I, if I look at that, it's all about people. There was a, a woman, Holly, who used to work on a marketing team, and she goes, Brian, you always say it's all about people. Like, you just constantly repeat that. We need to put it up front and center in the main foyer of our office. And I was like, yeah, it's great. And she goes, but your name needs to be below it. People need to see it as a statement of what you believe, that we're building a company that's about finding the right people and treating them right. And if I think back to how that it's all about people belief came up for me. 1994, five years into the business, half a million in revenue, right around the time I was about to discover the e-myth. And nine, uh, one bad apple spoils the whole bunch. Uh, I had nine bad apples and I had 11 employees. So do the math, it's not a, a good sort of situation. I said, what am I gonna do? Do I get rid of nine people and preserve the two that are okay? I made a rash decision to fire my entire team, my entire company, 11 people. I was the At last- Half a million in revenue. Half a million in revenue. So I remember that morning, I literally had five trucks scheduled, jobs booked on all of them, and I sat down with my team in our morning huddle that we would typically do, but this one was different. I said, I'm sorry. So I started with those two words. It's all I knew to do was just apologize. I said, I'm sorry but I've let you down as your leader. I haven't found the right people or I haven't necessarily treated you right. I'm hiding in my private office. I'm not having fun in the business and I'm sorry, but I'm making a change and uh, we're gonna part ways. So I went from go having these five printed schedules for all the trucks, just constantly calling customers to say, I can't help you and it's gonna take time and I had to, I was just buried under this amount of business and what am I gonna do? And it was a disaster. I mean, it was, you know, like it was one of those moments where you're just, I mean, real WTF moment. And I'm like, man, what can I learn from this? And I, don't, I didn't ask myself that day. Uh, but I, I worked through about three to six months of rebuilding the business and said, what can I learn from this huge failure of me finding the wrong people? And it was just understanding that a business is only strong as the, the people you've got and they've got to fit culturally, they've got to believe in a vision, they have to believe in you as a leader, you have to believe in yourself, and so I just started to recruit differently. And I said, I'm gonna find people I wanna hang out with, people I can see being friends, having a beer with, and I recruited differently, and I, I got very, very careful and selective with who I brought in, and while it was hard going from half a million down to not being able to do much in terms of revenue, 
I was so careful in the people I brought on board that the company started to glow and shine. It was like, wow, this is a totally different place, and this is something I want to do forever. And so that philosophy is something that we really communicate through our entire teams and our franchise owners is you can't grow a business without having phenomenal people and phenomenal people for you, for what fits with your business. It's not like these nine bad apples were necessarily bad people. They just weren't the clean cut, happy, optimistic professionals that I saw uh, building my company with me. Mm -hmm. That is an extraordinary WTF willing to fail moment. Yeah. Um, so in your book, you talk about just, and I want to extrapolate on this one phrase because it is very interesting. You talk a lot about the heart of an enthusiastic founder mm -hmm. within the business. What does that mean to you when, you, when you're looking at people, um, you're, you're recruiting, you have candidates coming at you. What does it mean to look for someone with the heart of an enthusiastic founder? That's a great question. Actually, no one's asked me that before. Um, you know, so if I look at the people in my life and my story that have really been a part of the book and the story, you know, Eric Church as COO, Cameron Harold as former COO and friend, or any of our top franchise partners, they've got heart. They're not doing this to tell their team what to do, to make sure it's all about the bottom line. The bottom line comes when you focus with heart on your people, on developing them, on developing and achieving a vision together and winning together. And so I think heart just symbolizes that this is about some business is much more than money. You, know, you and I were talking about business in the 60s and 70s you'd brought up was people probably weren't getting out there going, I'm going to raise a ton of money and I'm going to do this. And that, like they were just building businesses organically. And I think what this group, what we all probably do well is we're building businesses slowly but surely, but with treating people right. And when you care for your people and you have that heart, um, I think that makes all the difference. So if I look at the heart of a founder, if we're looking for franchise owners for any one of our brands, they have to just have that get it factor to say this, this isn't just about, this isn't a job, this isn't making money, this is about something much, much bigger, and us wanting to understand what's behind their heart. Why do they want to do this? Why wow one day painting? Like, who wants to paint? It's much bigger than that, and understanding that is important. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Um, let's let's kind of switch gears here and talk about more about peer groups and and surrounding yourself with with smart, hardworking, passionate people that drive your success as a leader. I think. Um, we all face this, this challenge of, yes, we have many employees, we have strong leaders maybe in our business that ultimately report to us, but it can be a very lonely island at the top, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, the challenges that we deal with, the, the pressures from our staff, the pressures from the customers, the financial pressures, cash flow, all that kind of stuff. Um, it, it, it can get truly, truly difficult, and, it, and, it's, and you can often feel quite alone. Mm -hmm. um, how did you surround yourself with people, and, and why was that so important to you, that, that lift you up as a leader, and that, show you, that, that help you uh, guide forward um, within your organization? Yeah, so joining EO, Entrepreneur Organization, was my answer to I didn't finish school wasn't smart enough, couldn't stay focused, whatever it is. And I said, but I want to learn from others. And so I got out there and I, you know, I had friends that were getting MBAs and felt maybe a little envious in my 20s and so I, I created my own MBA. I said, yeah, I got an MBA. It stands for Mentor Board of Advisors. And I just went out there and I recruited people, friends, other business people. I started asking questions and learning from others. And so my first real moment of, of having a true MBA type learning from others was, I remember in about 96, I went out and said, hey, I'm looking at franchising my business. Who can tell me whether or not this is franchisable? I started going to some people who were execs from McDonald's and other great franchise brands, and I said, oh, this is what I want to do. What do you think? Yeah, can't be done. You mean I can't do it? No, I don't think anybody could do it. And there was this conversation with people who were real experts in franchising, about a dozen of them, and they all told me it couldn't be done. But I did one thing that I, looking back, was, was really, really important, was I said, why can't it be done? What's missing? 
you're rejecting me by saying no, I didn't say this, but you're saying no to my idea. I want to understand what don't you like about the idea? What's missing? What would make it franchisable? And I feverishly took notes in every one of these conversations. I retweaked my model. You know, what the, the response was is my company, the Rubbish Boys 738 Junk, anybody can go out and buy a pickup truck. Anyone can haul junk. Why, why would they join your franchise? And they were right. We needed a brand. 1-800-GOT-JUNK. We needed a call center so we could do the booking and dispatch and build something nationally. But I retooled this model based on the learning I got from them. Most people would walk away and say, you think it's a bad idea? Oh, okay, I'll go find someone who thinks it's a good idea. No. Find the people that think your idea sucks and find out what's missing and retool. So mentors have been incredibly important in my life. And you, know, you hear that message, you, 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 know, you don't want to be the, the smartest guy in the room. Um, some people can look at what I, we have built and go, Brian's really smart. You know what? I'm, honestly, I'm not that freaking smart. I'm good at finding smart people and putting them together to say, do you want to be a part of this vision? Do you want to build this with me? Are we, do we see the same vision and painted picture of where we're going? And that's been, uh, I think that's been the magic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's, let's, let's talk a bit more about technicalities here. Um, People love, we, we all love growth in the way that it, that, that, it, that it pushes us to be bigger, to be stronger leaders, um, to push our boundaries. When we talk about like applying structure through an organization so that it can grow as one big system, when you went from the rubbish boys and hauling junk in Vancouver to the world's largest junk removal system franchise across continents, um, what were some of those, those, those big nuggets, those big secrets uh, that, uh, that you think are most important when it comes to implementing strong structure across a business so that it can grow mm -hmm. effectively? Yeah, I, you know, I think everything I ever learned in the first decade of franchising and, and systematizing my business was really from the e -myth. Mm -hmm. And so Michael Gerber, who's since become a friend, he's like 83 years old now, and we, we talk fairly frequently, he's, a, he's an interesting man. He, he taught me that you, you build your business out like a franchise, and every single thing has to be systematized so that everyone's doing it the right way. And the right way doesn't mean it's forever the right way. It just means it's the best practice that you know today. So after reading the book, before meeting Michael, I, I went on a mission to take every practice in my business. How do we load the trucks? How, how do we greet a customer on the phones? Uh, what's important in the cleanup? How do we price jobs? Everything. And I said, every single process in the business has to come down to one page. So I'd take a one page best practice in a three ring binder and I'd say, this is how we do this and I'd write it out. And until someone came up with a better way, that wasn't going to change. And that became the basis for our manuals, our operating systems, our training systems. Um, it's been funny, because as the business grows to where we are today, I mean, there's systems and things I hear about that I have no idea that I'm like, whoa, we do that? And that's where the letting go as an entrepreneur, as you grow and scale, you hear that more and more. And it's a challenge I, I put on to all of you who want to grow and scale is, is how do you let go? You need the right person, the right processes in place, and then trust that those things are being done, but inspect what you expect. So a philosophy I have, so as a founder and CEO, I still to this day, um, I actually did one last night, I don't do it every day, I probably, you know, once or twice a month, I'll pick up the phone and I'll call our call center. And I'll just check in and, and ask different questions and, and just see what's happening. I'll talk to friends who have used our service and ask questions. I inspect what I expect to ensure it's happening. I'll go to certain web pages and different things just to check them out once in a while and I'll notice a problem and I'll report it. And people call it the Scudamore effect. It's like, oh yeah, whenever Brian looks at something, it's broken. No, it's just inspecting what we expect to make sure that we're living up to the, the standards that we set for ourselves. Yeah, cool. Um, you're a really big believer in strong brand. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see your shoes. We have oh, two brands. brands on the side. <laughs> um, ABC, always be branded, or that's ABB. Oh, anyways, always be branded. Just, you know, never my truck. Good. You were never good at alphabet. <laughs> exactly. Anyways. My truck, I mean, if you, my truck's in the parking lot and it's this entire wrapped Toyota Tacoma. Like, I just, I mean, it's a belief I have, really, is always be branded. You just, if you're so proud about your business, 
I mean, I love seeing all the BTA hats. This is a tribe for you guys, and everyone's wearing toques, and I gotta get one of those, uh, a jacket and shirt and all that. It's great. It shows others how passionate you are about what you're building. Yeah. So my yeah. wife, I tried to even talk my wife into wrapping the Volvo, and she's like, no, come on. It's your business, not mine. <laughs> the little Fiat cruising around by in yeah. a few years ago, and now the yeah. Tacoma is there everywhere. No, it's good. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the brand is, 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 is super important. I, I kind of took that to heart from, um, from the, actually, right from the beginning of BTA, from one of our conversations, and, um, and connected with, with Noel Fox, mm -hmm. for instance. Um, in your book, you talk about a guy who's the wizard of ads. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can speak to that really quickly. But the, the, the bigger point here is um, th there's a lot to creating success in, in business. Um, there's you know bringing in the right leaders in your company. There's bringing in the right team. And there's also bringing in the right specialists in different things, whether it's your wizard of ads or your Noel Fox or the myriad of other um, you know amazing specialists and, and, and vendors mm -hmm. you use. So tell me a bit about like like why that's why that's so important and, and how you found and surrounded yourself by such amazing specialists and experts. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So Noel Fox is phenomenal. He's a great friend. He's someone I met through. Uh, someone in our business who introduced us and said, I think this guy can help you with some of your design. I've met tons of designers and people that are even smarter than Noel, but I think what's been great with Noel and I is the chemistry. You've got to find a partner, and I don't mean just actual partner in your business, but a vendor, someone you're working with who's smarter than you. There's got to be a chemistry. And Noel and I speak the same language, so I'll tell you a quick story here that when we came up with Wow One Day Painting, one of the big mistakes we made when we launched the business was we made it look like 1-800-GOT-JUNK. And we had this purple and orange colors. It, it looked very collegiate. It was more like a student painting business, which those are great, but that's not what we were trying to be. And our phone number and our logo said 1-888-WOW-ONE-DAY. And it was just, it wasn't the right look and feel. When we realized that, so orange being one of our colors, and we had orange jackets and shirts, and. We heard from a customer once, they're like, by the way, if you want people, if you want trust to be something really important in your business and having your employees come in and your painters, they go, I recommend that you don't use penitentiary orange as your color. And I was like, oh, you're right. Bunch of guys walking in, gals as painters, and I mean, it's just terrible. So I said, okay, we're gonna rebrand. So I go to Noel and I said, we gotta rebrand, we gotta create this thing. And we struggled and struggled and struggled. And one day I was in Florence, Italy on vacation with my family and I saw a big gelato stand and 50 flavors of gelato. And one of the gelatos jumped out at me. And it's because it had two eyes made of lemons and a little smile made with a lime. And, and I looked at that and I'm like, of all the 50 flavors, that one's cute. That one's kind of talking to me. And uh, I took a picture of it and I sent it to Noel and I go, whatever they've done with gelato, we need to do with paint. And that chemistry and that connection of him being able to translate what I saw after us struggling with the redesign, he got it and he came up with the logo that we love today, which is this smiley yeah. blob of paint and it. And it's just, it's awesome. So it's finding the right partner, but making sure the chemistry is there because you can't just have the smarts the more important part. So the wizard, I mean, here's another quick story. Can I tell a story about the book? a good one. So WTF, willing to fail. We go down and see the wizard who writes all our radio creative, and if you've ever heard them, I'm sorry. Um, I know my kids are like, you're so irritating every time I hear you. And so these radio ads, he's just a genius at writing the right ads and having people say things in a weird way that, you know, I'm high-pitched voice when I do the ads and they work. The Roy says to me, he, I go down every year to see him in Austin, and he goes, you gotta write a book, you gotta write a book. And he says it every year, and I'm like, Roy, I don't wanna write a book. He goes, why not? And I go, I'm a terrible reader. Yes, I can write, but I, I just don't have the patience. You know me, I'm ADD. He goes, I'll make it easy. He goes, we're gonna write this together. He put me in his wizard's tower, which is this five-story spiral, feels like Hogwarts. And we're in there, and he opens up a bottle of wine at 8.30 in the morning, and he goes, have a drink and start talking. <laughs> start telling me some stories. So literally, the two of us, I was mic'd up like this all day for 10 hours, and he just asked question after question, story. We went through it, and we had a 135-page transcript of my stories. And then we started working on, he structured how the story would be, and we just put it all together. And that's an example, again, of I couldn't write my own book. I can tell stories. 
they're legit stories. I, I can actually write, but I couldn't focus for an entire book. And he helped me write a book that I feel really proud of. And so the magic is having someone who can be, again, yin, yin chi or yang. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Let's, let's talk on that note. Let's, let's talk a, really quickly about marketing. Um, you, you, you mentioned this a couple times uh, in the book and in just conversation. Enthusiasm is contagious. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the role, especially as a business grows and you have uh, a marketing person or a robust marketing team, what's the role of a founder uh, within a marketing organization? Mm -hmm. I think a founder in any company, I think a leader in any company, your role is to lead by example. And because we are a happy business, I mean, we actually, when we look for franchise partners, we call it the four H's. They have to be happy, hardworking, hungry, and hands-on in the beginning. And so that happiness is a part of our business. So who's gonna lead that? I am. You know, if I'm having a bad day, I learned this very quickly, actually not quick enough, but I, I learned it in the business that I saw when I was having a bad day, everyone else was having a bad day. When I was down and depressed or you know, angry or frustrated with something, it, it transpired onto others. We have open office environment. No one has a private office, not myself, not Eric, our president. It's all out in the open. And we feed off of each other's energy. So my role as a founding leader is to, I think, cheerlead the energy. And I think anyone on any team what are you expecting from your team? Be that. Be to your world, to your team, what you expect. Like role model that energy. Cool. Very, very good. And what do you do just on that note? We all have, we all have our challenges, the tough days, whether it's stuff in, um, you know, in, in work or, 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 or others. Um, what do you do to really rel uh, to to kind of to control, not to control, but to, to keep that happiness, to control your, um, your the kind of ups and downs, mm -hmm. to keep those lows from getting too low. Uh, tell me a bit about like whether it's morning routines or weekly practices mm -hmm. or annual practices. We just talked about going dark and the amount of time you spend in Europe and skiing and things like that. What do you do to stay happy, if you will? Yeah, so as a company, we do a daily huddle, a seven-minute stand-up huddle that hopefully one day when you come to the junction, you can witness at 10.55 a.m. every single day, we do this all-hands-on-deck company meeting. And it's a chance for us to see how the energy is. What are people talking about? We share good news. We talk about missing systems, all sorts of stuff. And I think what I've learned is, is be real, be authentic. If it's a bad day, if something bad's happened, don't pour energy into it, just you know, own up to it. Sorry this has happened. You know, on days when we've laid off people years ago, you know, I had to get up at huddle after we laid off 52 people in 2007 and, and say sorry. You know, and, and, and you know, I shed a few tears, which was a first, and, and, and I was just like, oh my gosh, this is hard. But people, I think, can see that we're real. And when the time's right to be optimistic again, get back there. But it's a daily pulse on our optimism. Uh, what do I do personally to stay happy? Um, my Peloton I love. You know, I get on the spin bike and I'm just hardcore addicted to trying to be energized every day and, and be healthy. Uh, so exercise has been an incredibly important part. Uh, not of my 30-year journey, because there's parts there where I was like, I went a decade without exercising. That's not too cool. Um, things like uh, going dark. So my going dark means, and, and we, we, so what I do is when I'm going away on vacation, so I took 18 days over the Christmas holidays, and when I go dark, I tell my assistant, Jen, change my passcode on my email, my social media, everything. I have no access. And it's the only way that I can trust myself to not get into my email. And I've been doing it for, I don't know, 10, 15 years, at least, 20 years. And I remember the first time my assistant at the, mo at the time said, what do, you, what do you mean? I can't change your passcode and not text you and not call you. Like, what if the office burns down? I'm like, call 911. What am I going to do from France? You know, like, I mean, seriously. And, and I'm like, if someone dies, if there's a tragedy, if I'm really needed for something, I mean, come on, reach out. But, but nobody has and people don't. And so I tried to set the tone that I believe that people talk about work-life balance, but I don't know how much they really balance. I think they just integrate them and it's dizzying. And so for me, I need to disconnect from my business. I did five weeks last year in one stretch. 
And people go, but it's a half a billion dollar business. How can you do that? Because I have a backup. I have Eric, who is my guy that I trust to do anything I would do. Then this isn't just a CEO and COO go dark policy. I wrote a, an article in Wall Street Journal about it. And you've ever heard of trolls out there on the internet and all the negativity? Man, did I get slammed for that one. I wrote this article about going dark and everyone's like, whoa, must be nice to be king, must be you know, awesome to be a CEO of a big company and be able to do that. I bet his people wish they could do that. And I'm like, no, this wasn't, I, I, I miswrote or misinterpreted my going dark. This was something I expected for everyone in the company. So we put a policy in place and we said, when you're on vacation, we give five weeks paid vacation to all of our employees. When you're on vacation, take a vacation. Do not check email. And we'll get people to change passwords. We'll encourage them to do, but you have to have a backup. So when anyone in any business, you know, you're in a roofing business and you've got an operations manager out there and that person needs to take a vacation, they better have a backup operations manager who can do everything that person does. But it is so freeing. People go, ah, I don't want to come back to a bazillion emails. Well, you shouldn't because your person on your team should be able to back you up and deal with all the stuff that happened while you're away. Yeah, amazing. There's a good word you said, and it, it can be dizzying and trying to manage. I'm on vacation with my family, and I'm trying yeah. to be present, but I'm yeah. also thinking about my work, and these emails are stacking up. It's, it, it absolutely can be dizzying, 100%. Um, let's, let, let's talk a bit about uh, a, a, a topic that I, found, that I find fascinating in your background, and, and that is that you are no stranger to having to start over and over and over again. Um, and because of that, that's what I think really, that's why you know what it takes to succeed. So tell us a bit about some of the, the toughest, most difficult decisions you've ever had to make. And specifically, um, what did you have to face mm -hmm. in order to make those decisions? Yeah. Uh, what did that dark place in the middle, that difficult dark place in the middle mm -hmm. look like? Mm -hmm. and, and what did you learn coming out the other side of, of, of some of these situations? Sure. So I'll tell you the toughest decision I've ever made, uh, but first I'm just gonna frame it with, so the book WTF, one of the best things of, of writing or co-writing that book with Roy, <clears throat> The Wizard of Ads, is he, through the process as a branding guy, I kept going to Noel and Noel Fox and say like, what's, what's the title of the book gonna be? And we brainstormed and Roy's like, don't think of the title, just write the freaking book. And I go, Roy, I'm a branding guy. Wow, one day painting Shack Shine, I need that brand to, to shine first so I know how to frame it. He goes, no, 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 tell the stories, we'll write the book, we'll close the book, and the title will jump out at us. And I had a hard time trusting him that that was the right way. But what was cool is when the book was written, I'm like, WTF, willing to fail, holy crap. Every single story is about fail, grow, fail, grow, fail, grow, fail, grow. And so the best part about writing the book for me was realizing my life has been failure after failure after failure. But I've always embraced failure as a gift. You know, so another quick story. Sorry, I'm so ADD. I Let's apologize. Do it. But uh, there's a squirrel right there in the rafters. Okay, so my, my, <laughs> my middle daughter, I don't know, four or five years ago, she was in ski school here up at Whistler. And skiing can be hard for little kids. They're learning. It's cold. They're falling. And she was in tears. She's like, I hate this. I'm falling all the time. And I'm like, you're falling? She's like, yeah, and I go, that's awesome. Falling is how you learn. You fall, you learn to think about what you can avoid doing differently so that you don't fall. I'm like, falling's the best part because soon you're gonna never fall again. And so at the end of the next ski day, she comes up to me, she's like, guess what? Big smile, she goes, I fell. And I'm like, yes, like proud dad moment, right? But I'm like, it's way easier said than done, I get it. But every time you can take a failure, and when you're ready, it could be a day after a failure, it could be a week, it could be a month, take out a piece of paper and write what's one, at least one big thing that is going to happen in my life or my business because of that failure, you will be blown away at the things that happen. So back to my ADD, what was the real question? <laughs> the real question is tell us oh, about the biggest some failure. Of yeah. So Biggest failure by far, I mean, yes, I fired 11 people. Yes, I got rid of my um, number one you know, employee my, my, and, and great friend, my COO. So I go out to recruit the right person to run the business. And I get introduced through networks to a person who was the ex-president of the US operations of Starbucks. 30,000 employees under this person's lead. I'm like, oh my gosh, this person wants to move from Seattle back to Vancouver where they grew up. 
I, I hit the jackpot. They were willing to take a massive salary cut because they believed in my business and could build this to the next lever, level. It was just like absolute jackpot. I was more impressed by this person's pedigree than anything, and I didn't spend the time getting to know if this was a yin-yang type setup. And it's interesting, too, because apparently it's textbook. You get the first COO who becomes a friend. The second one is someone who you fail with massively. And the third one, you learn from it all and you get it right. So my second Star the Starbucks person, they come into my business. And the first five months were amazing. By about month six, I, I come back to the business after a holiday, and I'm like, I don't know if I recognize my business and my team. And it got worse and worse and worse. And I realized this was no longer my leadership team. They weren't believing in me. They were following this person. But the problem in following this ex-Starbucks is this person didn't believe in me. They didn't believe in me as a founder. And you know, there was over, over time, I'd hear stories about how this person didn't believe in Howard Schultz, the founder of Starbucks, and just didn't connect with founders. And I was like, man, this isn't going well. We were three days, I was three days away from raising a bunch of money that would have given up half the business and I would have been booted out. Uh, and I had a, a venture capital person come to me and goes, you know what, I, I know we're about to do a deal together, but I gotta let you know, I don't think that person has your back. And I looked into it and started to realize that person was right. I didn't sign the deal. I got rid of a ton of people in the business and rebuilt. I hunkered down and just said, we're not going to raise money. We're going to survive without giving up equity. We're going to rebuild this. So I had to get rid of this person. Now, when I say the toughest decision, I got rid of this person. We had our regional meetings with franchise, franchise partners, which means six days, six cities across North America planning meetings, here's the vision for the next year. I went to every one of those, and so you gotta think of a franchise partner going, a week ago you fired the leader that we believed in. I saw something they didn't see. So they all thought I was crazy. And so what I did is I'd come into a room very much like this, and I explain, and I'd apologize, and I said, what I want you to do is there's post-it note flip charts all over the walls. I want you to write up every question you have without me in the room. I don't care how much, how long it takes, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna answer every single one transparently, straight from my heart as to what's going on. And I did that to help try and build some trust and I think it helped. Uh, but it was a good, you know, people said, Brian, you are not the CEO of this business. You can't do it. We love you as a visionary, but you can't do this. You're awful at it. And so that was hard on my ego and I made the mistake on the wrong person and they didn't see what I saw. They see it now, and everyone understands it led me to Eric. So if I take that moment of when I was ready to take out a sheet of paper and what is going to come from this big failure, the hardest decision I ever met, getting rid of that person, it was me understanding how I missed what I was looking for in the right person. And when I met Eric, one thing that came out when he and I were having some beers and chatting through his history is he's only worked for founders. Every single job, every single business he's ever built, he worked with the founder. And he said to me that day, he goes, if this works out, he goes, I want you to know I'm only here as long as you are. If you one day want to sell your business and move off to the Bahamas, he goes, I'm going with you. I'm not, I'm not staying in, in the business. And that was one of those moments where it was like, yeah, found the right guy, the right mm -hmm. person. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and I know we want to take some time to get to some questions, so I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of questions in the room, and we'll have, a, we'll have a mic runner. I have, before we do that, I have kind of one more big question here, and is, it, is this. Um, we live in a world where uh, the true battle to success, I think, is diluted. Um, social media has a big influence. Technology companies have a big influence. It's, it's, it's an attitude of, you know, kind of like you said before, is, is, is build a business quick, sell, get out. Um, you're over 30, over 30 years in now. Mm. Um, what, why do you think great entrepreneurship requires so much consistent, intentional work over a long period of time? And what drives you to stay so committed to the course? Mm -hmm. That's a big question. So I think when you really understand what motivates you. Now, what motivates me and what motivates each one of you is very different, I'm sure. But when you understand at your core what motivates you, you make the right decisions. I was out on a fishing boat 
I talk about this in the book, but I was out on a fishing boat, uh, two people who were garbage company executives, waste management, there's been ties with mafia and waste, and there I am out on a boat, middle of nowhere, off of Vancouver Island, up the north end where it was super quiet, and these guys are telling me from waste management, $13 billion business, that they want to buy my company. I, I said, no. Like, I just, I, I'm not ready to sell. I don't know if I ever want to sell. I believe too much in what I'm building. And they said, we're talking like 75 to $100 million. And this was a time when I was quite a bit smaller. And I said, no. And they're like, are you kidding me? We're out on this boat together. We're offering you $100 million. I'm like thinking to myself, am I going to get thrown overboard and never to be seen again? And they're going to have the company. But I was like, I, I said at that moment, I go, you could give me a billion dollars, something so ridiculous that I could take that money and start something else and start again. But I said, I don't want to start again because I believe in this. I am committed to this. So what are you committed to? You know, it doesn't matter if you've got a plumbing, a roofing, a painting business, a junk hauling business. What is it really about? Because it probably is not about the business. And so for me, I, I stay committed because I'm committed to developing our people. I'm committed to find the right people and treat them right. I love nothing more. So I'm not a money guy, right? I mean, I drive my Toyota Tacoma and it's four by four and it's everything. Uh, I don't need another car. I don't need a sports car. I don't need anything fancy. I don't think I've I, ever seen Brian in anything but Converse All Stars. Yeah. <laughs> They're not great in snow, but anyways, I wore them today just for you guys. So I sit there and I look at Paul Guy, who's a franchise owner, who owns, uh, I don't know, he's the first franchise partner he started in Toronto. Cars are important to him. He loves sports cars. He's got an Audi R8. That's cool that this business was able to provide him what he wanted. But that's not what I want. And so what I get jazzed on is when you see people in your business living the dream, whatever that dream is to them, the freedom, the lifestyle, the commitment, the, the having fun, whatever it is. And I think that's to the, the core of your question is what motivates me? As long as I understand my motivation and this business can be a tool to get more of that, then I'm committed, I'm all in.